Hello guys, it's the Caribbean Bookworm and despite what I said in my intro to the last um, part 5 of the journey to relativity, I did manage to have a basically a whiteboard for yet another video for our journey to relativity, namely our journey to relativity part 6. And it, this one is going to be our last video with a whiteboard, so that's unfortunate, but it's actually quite handy for what we want to talk about today. In this journey to relativity, basically, I want to talk about this new symbol that we're going to introduce called Christoffel symbols, which I know what you're taking again with more notations, but we're getting somewhere. These are all leading to basically what we need for relativity. Um, and these Christoffel symbols are in essence something which are used and especially important when trying to define something called a covariant derivative. So quite a lot of jargon were introduced right there. So without further ado, let's dive into the topic of today. So one thing I want you to think about before talking about any of those weird mumbo jumbo concepts is imagine if you have a vector, say a vector v, and you want to add um, another vector onto this vector. Now this vector exists in an arbitrary coordinate system with various lines going like this basically. And um, if you have a grid like this and you have a coordinate system and your vector starting right here, if I have an arbitrary vector, say vector u, if I want to add these vectors together, then what I will be doing is in essence, I will be dragging this vector um, all the way to the same point at which the, our vector v starts. And then I will be transporting it, you could say parallel to this um, point, to this, um, to the head of the vector v, right? So basically what that would look like is the following. So we track our vector u, place it right here, and then we track it, that um, bit and basically move it up to the head of the vector u, giving us the following scenario with vector u, let's call it u prime. Um, and then that basically gives you the figure, which if you add them together, it gives you your vector v plus u. In essence, this process of moving vector u to where we want in order to get this head tail configuration it is something that we call a parallel transport of a vector, in this case of vector u. What that means is, in essence, we're transporting this vector u parallel to itself, um, as in basically the direction um, of this vector u is not changing. It stays the same, but we can basically move it around wh wherever we want in our grid. Because if you recall um, the video which we talked about the formal definition of um, basically of a vector, um, the nowhere in the definition is um, something said about where the vector needs to originate in order to be called a vector. Basically meaning that the, some of the assumptions that we made in our earlier videos on our journey to relativity isn't necessarily needed to be the case. It isn't needed necessarily to start your vectors always on the origin. You can start them wherever you want on your grid um, because the main two things which we defined rank one tensors, aka vectors, to be um, is basically that the norm remains the same, the norm remains coordinate invariant, and that basically it respects a particular transformation rule. So something interesting to look at, for example, when we look at this case right here, is if we parallel transport our vector u, say if this grid represents um, 2D Cartesian coordinate system, so x1, x2, or rather our x and y plane, if we transport this, move this here, then move this here, would the x and y components of this vector u change right here? Now, that would actually be the case. These components would change. The components that you have right here for u, um, u1 and u2 would not be the same as you have right here for u1 prime, u2 prime, because we move them around where you have different values, in essence, on your given grid. This is a very interesting and crucial component, um, crucial aspect of basically parallel transporting because what this tells us, if, if we grab, for example, the partial derivative of uh, vector u over our coordinate system of xi, then this isn't necessarily a covariant property. It is not something that is coordinate independent. This partial derivative depends on xi, it depends on the coordinate system you're using. Because I can grab an example, for example, in which I take, for example, if we're not looking at another vector v, if we're just looking at, 
factor u and u prime if we're just looking at these two factors right here in the grid if i were to take a different coordinate system in which i rotate this grid right here and i make it instead of having like these square um blocks i make it um something that's more um circular so say a planar polar coordinate system then in essence what it would look like and if we take this as our radius for example if we wrote change this this is what we will have. We could have, for example, as I've drawn right here, a sort of a planar polar coordinate system in which basically the grid um, lines would not basically make rectangular um, figures or square figures, you could say, but they would more or less make these sort of circular, um, basically, patterns. If we have um, our vector u starting, you could say, at the origin of this coordinate system, and we parallel transported it to an arbitrary point on this coordinate system, then you can notice that regardless um, of where we place it right here, uh, because it is laid straight on this horizontal, say, coordinate system right here, no matter where we um, parallel transport our um, vector u, um, it is going to remain without a vertical component regardless of how we move it around. This is simply because of the coordinate system of which we've chosen. And this implies that, for example, if we call this coordinate system to have like the input, so x1, x2, x3, x4, etc. If you call it xj, and you remember the one which you called earlier in the, in the Cartesian coordinate system, we call it xi. That means that the partial derivative for u with respect to xi is not equal to the partial derivative for u with respect to xj, meaning that this partial derivative component right here is coordinate um, is coordinate variant. Like it depends on which coordinate system you're using. So if we want to have a coordinate invariant um, sort of partial derivative scenario, and that is typically very crucial if you want to find things like the dot product or find the um, curl or the divergence of a vector field, then we need to find the coordinate invariant way of getting the partial derivative of vectors or vector components at least. And the way we do that is by using something called the covariant derivative, which we will introduce right now. Now there are various ways in which we can go to find, for example, the divergence of a vector field um, by just doing things like using the del operator to, to get the dot product um, with the vector that you're um, doing the things with. Um, and in essence, it might work, but it might take a little bit of work because you then have to know your multivariable calculus to apply um, the chain rule. And in terms of multivariable calculus, the chain rule takes, it can take at least quite a little bit of work. So in order to very visually illustrate what I mean by this, say you have a factor A that consists out of three components that existed in 3D Cartesian coordinate system. So a vector A, basically that looked as the following, A, I, with e i hat, basically written in terms of index contraction. In essence, if we want to take the divergence of this and say we define our del operator to be the following, this upside down triangle right here, where in essence, um, this um, chronicle delta right here basically serves to raise our index um, for our j right here to make it into an i in order to make sure that we have a del operator with an upper index of i in order to basically imply summation. By the way, before continuing, I will just change these dummy indices right here of A to an index of K in order to um, avoid any further confusion as we're further calculating. If we want to look at the divergence right here, so we take the dot product of this operator right here with the vector A, what we should get is the following. So we get that we have to take the dot product of this, right here. So when taking the dot product, you can recall that in essence, we're taking the product of the corresponding components with each other. So definitely we will have this del right here, del j times a k. And this will be multiplied by the corresponding um, base vector. So in this case, it will be e i hat dot e k hat. And in the front, we're going to have the chronicle delta, which we had already, and that was chronicle delta of i, j. And now we can already see something. We can see that this right here can become a chronicle delta with lower index of i, k. 
So if we can rewrite this right here, we can write this as chronicle delta i k. And we have two chronicle deltas right here. This means we can write this as a chronicle tensor um, by doing a little bit of index contraction. We can write it with a chronicle tensor of um, rank one by one, um, making it um, the chronicle tensor in this case of j k multiplied by this right here. And finally, write this as the partial derivative with respect to the j component of a j. Basically, this um, chronic tensor right here converted an index of k right here on this a um, object and made it into an uh, index of j with um, still an upper index. And what this chronic tensor of rank 1 by 1 is going to do is it's going to basically take the j index of this partial derivative right here and convert it into a a k so it's going to um, ensure that the final thing which we have written is a del notation right here with a lower index of k multiplied by the a with the same upper index of k right here so that is in essence what this chronic tensor has done and that is leaving us with an expression for the um, for the divergence of the matrix a which is simply expressed then as this very compact notation right here. Now this notation for the divergence of a vector field in terms of A being in a 3D Cartesian coordinate system works fine because in essence what this gives us is a partial derivative of A1 with respect to X1. It gives us the following three values. Why not multiply by their corresponding base vectors, you may ask, and that is because we said that in Cartesian coordinate system, we take this E1 hat, E2 hat, and E3 hat to be unit vectors, or actually physical vectors, um, with magnitudes of 1. So if you take the derivative of them with respect to any of these x1, x2, x3 components, you get a value of 0. So when you do the product rule, you still end up with a value of zero for these. So that third, the term that contains the derivative of E1, E2, and E3 had they fall out, leaving you with this, which as you can see, can very compactly be written indeed as this right here. But this is of course not true for, um, for basis vectors, which we do describe with changing variables. So very simply look at the following, which um, entails to the um, cylindrical polar coordinates. Say we describe the vector B right here in terms of cylindrical coordinate system. What this would give us, it would give us in essence B rho um, with respect to the natural basis of G rho hat plus B phi. It gives us in essence this expression right here for um, our B vector in terms of cylindrical coordinates, which we can write a little bit more condensedly as B upper index I lower and multiplied by the natural um, natural basis of G lower index I hat. Because we know that this G rho, G phi, and G z hat, um, that these do not necessarily have to be constant, and in this case they are not constant, and in a lot of curvilinear coordinate systems they're not constant, then we know that, that basically the expression right here for the divergence of something, say if you want to take the divergence of this vector B right here, it cannot be very compactly written in terms of just something that looks in the following fashion right here. Because we know then that we have to take the derivative of this G, G I hat component into account. The, all of this further justifies why we need to find a coordinate, coordinate invariant um, way to describe partial derivatives. Because if you have something that is coordinate invariant, then we can write, in essence, using the definition which we have for our coordinate invariant derivative or our covariant derivative, we can find a way in which we can write this notation right here, and it works for every coordinate system in essence. So that is what we're going to try and do, and we're going to we're going to try and build up to that basically. So the way so the way we can go about starting and talking about this is again by looking at a very simple factor. Let's say again a factor this time a factor w, and we displace the vector. Um, we do we apply a parallel transport and move the vector c right here. So we have w like right now that is 
parallel transport. We just call it PT. I'll just note this PT shorthandedly to just show that it's parallel transported. Now, how can we write the components of this vector W right here? We know that this vector W consists of, for example, W multiplied by natural basis of G1, and then that again, W2 multiplied by G2, W3, um, G3, etc., etc. So how we can write that is by saying that this right here, this W with I components, so an I number of components, um, it is um, found by basically having an input of XK, where you can think of XK as being, for example, X1, X2, and so forth, all the way to XK. So having that input right here, you can write this as XK that is parallel transported. So if you want to find the components for this right here, it is equal to W with I components again, but this time with your original inputs of XK minus an infinitesimally small change in your, um, in your basically your original factor of WI. So what this is basically noting is if I have a vector W right here, and if I want to find this um, parallel transported vector W right here, I have to, in essence, take our original W right here and take a very small difference in, of change in um, WI right here. You can sort of think of this here being a very infinitesimally small difference in um, xk basically in the inputs that you have you take a very very small difference and that should show you basically um the your del wi right here which you will use for your parallel transported vector um, or in order to define your parallel transported vector so if we're talking about for this del wi component right here, about an infinitesimally small change, it means that this del wi right here, this delta wi right here has to be proportional in essence to the sum of um, basically the components of this vector right here multiplied by the in infinitesimally small change in C, for example, X1, X2, or X3, all the way to XK, depend on how, depending on how many components you have. So in essence, this basically just describes the component, the first component, the say the entreaty Cartesian coordinate system, you would say the X component of vector um, W multiplied by the small change in the X axis plus the, um, the y component of the vector w plus the small change in the y axis and you do that on for all of the components this would indicate in essence a very small change um, in the vector w in all of the dimensions of your coordinate system and if we know this then we can write this of course in terms of index notation more compactly as um, in essence this del wi right here would be something multiplied by our w j delta x k now i used um two different indices right here for w the one k of which i used that was um what we're used to because we indicated x k right here that being our input but we use a different notation right here for this WJ right here. Now that might seem a little bit odd, but the reason of which we did that is because the terms of which we have on we have on this right side right here um, doesn't necessarily have to correspond with the index that we have right here, this free index right here. We get this free index that just tells us how many components we have, and we have this um, W components right here, which the number of components of which you have on this right side does indeed cor correspond with the number of components you have, of course, for your W. But because we're looking at a whole new term right here of W um, times delta X, then we're not going to be using the same index for W as we're going to be using for the index of K. So in order to write this right here in this particular form, we need a tree index quantity right here. Um, and that tree index quantity is the new symbol that we're going to be introducing. And it's this, this upside down L looking thing, which is called the Christoffel symbol. And it's going to have an upper index of I and two lower indices of J and K. 
The slower indices in essence correspond with the indices of these two objects right here. And this free index is what we can see appearing on this side. And another justification as to why this index right here needs to be different than I is of course because we want dummy indices because we want to imply summation of these factors right here. If we have this be I in essence, then the I that appears right here is not valid because they, we only know that it is the free index, the index that appears only once in on one side of your expression that needs to um, be um, written in the other term of your expression as well. Hence why, again, we're changing the notation right here. Now that we have a factor right here, we can say definitively that we can define our, our small incremental change of our vector um, w as this equals the Christoffel symbol right here of uh, upper index i, lower index jk, multiplied by this component right here. This means that we can very formally write, for example, all of the components that we have written before, um, as for example, the Christoffel symbol of lower index 1, 1, um, of You can very formally write this as the following um, summation, for example, where you have these various indices which can combine with each other in various ways. Earlier when I wrote that this is proportional to the summation that I wrote, I only wrote, um, I only wrote basically these combinations right here um, of 1, 1 and 2, 2 and 3, 3 if you go on to 3. Um, but in essence, nothing is stopping you of getting these other permutation of, say, different numbered indices, so 1, 2, or 2, 1. Um, but this is very interestingly showing you how you can use the Christoffel symbols to write all of this more compactly. So knowing all of this, we can now write our W with our given input of XK, that is parallel transported. We can write it in terms of W, X, K with this xk being of course part of our original inputs and now instead of minus the delta the delta wi right here um, with the index of i i right here we are going to substitute what we just found um, um delta uh, wi to be so we're just going to write it then immediately in terms of the christoffel symbol i j k w j delta x k so now we, in essence, have found um, an expression for our vector um, wi right here that is parallel transported um, by using this following new notation right here. Now, I want you to keep this expression in mind as it's going to help us, in essence, derive the so-called covariant derivative, which is going to be a very useful thing to work with further on. So right now, let's look at well, exactly that, the covariant derivative. So when taking the derivative of a vector, so say, for example, instead of talking about partial derivative, let's just look at standard um, single variable notation for derivative. Say if our vector v only dependent on, dependent on a, var a variable of s. So whatever you throw in there for s, that depends um, on, that basically defines what you'll get for your vector v. That means that we can write our vector v in terms of s, by the way, I am using error notation here to differentiate um, these vector basically values from scalar, typical scalar functions as if I just wrote write v, it might be a bit confusing. Um, so if we are looking at the derivative of a vector, that means that we're looking at a very small incremental change, just as we've seen before um, with all of the examples which I showed. So in this case, say for example, um, if I were to look at the derivative, I would then have an input of s plus an arbitrary number h right here for my vector. That means that if I were to look at the derivative, the only thing that this is implying is if I have a dv that um, we're taking the derivative with respect to s right here, our input, um, this would give us the following. It gives us the following. It gives us, in essence, the difference between the new value which we have for our vector v minus the original um, thing that we have for our vector v, um, which is the input of s and not s plus h, all of that divided by h as um, h approaches zero. In essence, you're looking at the slope as you do with scalar functions. Um, this similar concept is what we're going to be applying right now. 
by now using partial derivatives as much of, most of the factors that we're interested in and most of the other mathematical objects that we're interested in, they depend on more than one variable. So we are going to have to take the partial derivatives um, instead of just single variable derivatives. In this case, the original input which we're going to be having is, say we use the same factor w, the original input that we have is w x k, with xk being the original thing that you threw in there. Um, and the new value which you will have is xk plus delta xk, where delta xk was the small little difference in, um, basically the small little difference in your coordinate system, the small little change, which was useful when, for example, describing the parallel transport. And lastly, before we dive into the partial derivatives, we know that the components of which these vector W consists out of are I components. So I can be two, three, and so on and so forth. Um, that means that if we want to take the partial derivative of this vector right here with um, the upper index of I that depends on X, K, that means that we would have to do similarly as you've seen before, we'd have to take the that which we got after um, applying this particular transformation. So that means that we have to write this particular bit minus what we had originally. So in essence, it looks almost exactly the same as what we've written before. The only thing is, instead of using S and H, we had XK and our H was X um, delta XK. So we take this fraction right here um, and basically take the limit of it as delta xk approaches zero. Now this expression for our partial derivative works fine, but the only thing is that it works only in Cartesian coordinate system. In order to find this for almost, for basically all coordinate system, in order to find the covariant derivative, we'd have to in essence look at the parallel transported um, basically bits of this um, variable right here. So instead of having this variable being the regular um, basically wi delta xk, we want to have it being parallel transported because then we can find basically the partial derivative um, for any um, coordinate system and not just for Cartesian coordinate system. And before finishing off, this is not delta xk as the delta xk is the bit at which you add onto it, but this is just the xk which we had right here. So all of this divided by delta xk is basically the expression and of course taking the limit of xk as it is approaching um, zero is basically how we are defining our partial derivative of wi with respect to xk with xk being Cartesian coordinate system. But there lies our problem. If we want to find the covariant derivative, a derivative which we can take with respect to any coordinate system, then we cannot just have our xk right here um, because this xk is only for um, basically Cartesian coordinate system. So how we can fix this problem is instead of having just xk, we take the parallel transported, um, we take the parallel transported value of wi xk because this um, parallel transported um, value for wixk would in essence respect whatever coordinate system it is in. So now we can actually substitute the equations which we found before into this fraction right here in order to finally find a more general expression for our covariant derivative. I can already write this right here instead of just our ordinary partial derivative of wi with respect to xk as our covariant derivative or cough d for example shortly by the way um when i wrote the parallel transport i should have only written it for the xk right here since it's the xk that is parallel transported that we're interested in um, so if we have this expression right here of w um, i xk parallel transported we recall that the expression for this was the following. We have this expression right here, and if we can substitute that into our fraction right there, then we can have the following expression for our covariant derivative. When we substitute what we had for the w xk with the xk which was parallel transported into the original fraction right here, um, by the way, now let's just change one small little detail which might not be obvious as to why we're changing it, but will appear to be crucial later on. Let's just change the second lower index um, right here in our Christoffel symbol as M instead of K. And that means that we have to write our delta X right here as delta X M instead of delta X K. So let's do that. Write that right here. 
Um, that basically means that what we're left with is the following expression right here with minus WXK of our original XK input plus our Christoffel symbol um, with the following term right here. Now, the reason, of course, we have minus is because we have this all minus the um, WXK um, parallel transported. And the first component which we had in the WXK parallel transported was a positive value of WXK of the original thing and that minus the Christoffel symbol of da 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 da. So if we have the negative of a positive number, we get just the negative of it. And we, if we have the negative of a negative number, which was this term right here, then we get a positive value for it. So if we have all of that, we can split this fraction into two bits. We can split this Christoffel symbol bit right here, and that gives us this Christoffel, this Christoffel symbol bit divided by the same numerator which we had have right here, because at the end of the day, it was part of the same um, if it was part of the same denominator right here. And we have this other term right here of um, w i da 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 da. Um, remember again, we had our limit of xk approaching zero. That still applies. Um, so we have still our limit of x delta xk approaching zero right here, as well for this term right here. So we see right now that we split this into two components with our limit of delta xk approach to zero for this and our limit for delta xk approach to zero for this Christoffel symbol bit right here. We can write this even more compactly, this component right here, as the following. So if I have this component right here, I can actually write this as the following. I can write this whole factor right here as, um, in essence, this Christoffel symbol multiplied by W um, J, and all of that um, multiplied by the fraction that we have right here of delta X M divided by delta X K. Um, so in essence, that leaves us with this following expression right here. So now you can see that basically we can write this factor right here as basically the Christoffel, this product of the Christoffel symbol and the WG right here. Um, and only leaving um, delta XM and delta XK basically as um, a fraction in this case. And you take the limit as delta XK approaches zero. So we wrote this in here, but one thing that we can also notice is that this expression looks frighteningly familiar. It is actually the partial derivative of, of the vector W with its I component um, with respect to um, XK basically. But it is in this case not the parallel transported XK right here. We have just a regular XK, which for example, it could be Cartesian coordinate system. Um, so we can just write this in essence then as this being in general then our expression for our um for our covariant derivative so our covariant derivative of w i with respect to x k is then equal to the partial derivative of w i with respect to x k so the one that is not the covariant derivative plus this term of um, the christoffel symbol right here we can compactify this even more by noting that the limit of delta x k as it approaches zero for this right here is just the partial derivative of x m with respect to x k this gives us finally our expression for the covariant derivative. So this is the derivative for our vector w i if we were interested in it for well, relatively any coordinate system. This is a coordinate invariant derivative basically. So more compactly in terms of index notation, I will write then that basically the um, covariant derivative, so with respect to k right here of w i, let's call that covariant, is equal to the partial derivative of the ordinary partial derivative, um, you could say of, well, the name ordinary is a bit deceiving if you do a lot of math, but let's just say the non, the invariant core, um, partial derivative of W plus this particular component right here. So this gives us, in essence, our expression for the covariant, um, the covariant derivative of our vector W i. If you can recall part five of our journey to relativity, we talked about this weird thing called the transformation tensor, which we defined as the following. We can recall basically that we defined this um, so-called um, transformation tensor with upper index of i prime and lower index of j um, being the partial derivative of x i prime 
with respect to um, XG. And that means that we can write it shorthandedly in terms of index contraction like this. We can also have the inverse of this transformation tensor, which could be denoted basically finding the transformation tensor where the I is not a prime, but the J is a prime, it is a J prime. That means that we have to take the partial derivative of Xi, not Xi prime, with respect to um, Xj prime. That means then that we will have this in terms of index contraction right here. So we have this transformation tensor right here, and we have the inverse transformation tensor right here. One thing that you can notice is that we're always taking this with respect to different coordinate system because this prime right here indicates that, oh, we're looking at a different coordinate system. We're looking at X prime or X I prime because it's X I in terms of a different coordinate system. Um, and here we have, we're taking um, the partial derivative with respect to J prime, which is in a different coordinate system. So for example, if X I was in Cartesian, then X I prime most definitely isn't in Cartesian. Um, or vice versa. So what would happen if we were to take um, this transformation tensor when they're um, both in the same, um, you could say, coordinate system? So we're taking things with respect to, for example, in Cartesian coordinate system. So we're taking, for example, the transformation tensor with upper index of i, lower index of j, taking the partial derivative of xi with respect to xj in coordinate, so they're in the same coordinate system. What that would then imply? Well, if these were in the same coordinate system, then what that would imply is if we multiply any mathematical object, a i with the transformation tensor i j, or say j i, then the only thing that happens is that it changes its index from i to a j while remaining it, maintaining it as an upper index. Um, you can try and um, see this for yourself, but what you can already see is that this basically implies that when they are in the same coordinate system, this boils down to a Kronecker tensor of ij, basically. So in essence, when you're in the same coordinate system, this expression right here um, of partial derivative with respect to xj of xi, it is the same as the Kronecker tensor of ij, basically. Knowing that, we can go on to what we were doing. Knowing that this was our expression for the covariant derivative of Wi, then we can see right here that, for example, we have a partial derivative of Xm with respect to Xk. Both of these are in the same coordinate system. So that basically means that um, we will um, have right here a Kronecker tensor of M. K. And since we have a Kronecker tensor of mk right here, that means that um, basically this partial derivative is within unity. If you take the partial derivative, for example, of x1 with respect to x1, you'd get a constant. So right here, if we do the same principle, then we know that we're going to get a unity property right here, and it's going to give us a value of 1 right here for this component, for this bit right here, because they're in, in essence, the same um, coordinate system. This leaves us with this following expression right here. And now, in order to finalize this compactification, instead of having to write this, um, basically this partial derivative notation with this call, um, cough every time on top to indicate that it's a covariant derivative, similarly to how we denoted partial derivative of something with respect to xi as being this shorthanded notation, there is a very similar way of expressing covariant derivative. And that is by using this del right here, this upside down triangle, and indicating with which index um, you are taking the covariant derivative of something, say if with k, that means that you're taking the partial derivative with respect to xk, um, that is specifically the covariant derivative. So this is the shorthand notation for this. It means that we can write right now this expression right here as the following. We can write it as del k of w i. And it basically compactify our notation, make it a little bit more clean and condensed. This, in essence, gives us finally a covariant derivative that is independent of the coordinate system that we choose. We still have yet to calculate the Christoffel symbols, and that is not something that we're going to do in this part of our journey to relativity, as that already takes quite a bit of time. 
but we should see that if we're looking in, for example, one um, in the Cartesian coordinate system, then this Christoffel symbol should be zero, it should fall out, make this term fall out basically, and that leaves us with just this term right here. And that makes sense then if you're, for example, looking at the divergence of um, a vector field within Cartesian coordinate system, as we expressed it to be the following. That means then that if we were to find the divergence of a vector field, say this dot this, and we know that this is not in Cartesian coordinate system, that means then that basically, um, of course, when taking the del operator, um, we're just, and the divergence of it, we're multiplying the components with itself. And if you remember, the components of the del operator is um, a set of partial derivative with an i number of components right here. So that means that we're going to have an i number of components for our del operators, or an i number of partial derivative, um, that multiplied by the corresponding components right here of our vector, say v with i components as well, that gives us this. And that means that we can basically plug in these indices in this expression right here, giving us a truly covariant um, divergence for our vector field, which looks as the following. It looks like this. This leaves us with this expression right here for our covariant divergence um, of our vector. I hope you found this video to be very informative and I hope you found this basically introduction to the Christoffel symbols um, to be quite fruitful and especially how things relate to the parallel transport of vectors as well as covariant derivatives. Um, next up in the following um, journey to relativity, we're going to be looking at how we can calculate actual values for these Christoffel symbols, as well as um, looking a little bit more closely into more things that we can do with um, some partial derivatives when it comes to vectors. I hope you look forward to that, and I hope to see you guys very soon again. Bye.